So bromeliad insects. This is going to be a story about plants and animals. Now you all know what insects are. Uh, but I wonder if you all know what a bromeliad is. Who has seen a bromeliad before? Uh, some hands. OK, now without saying anything, who has eaten a bromeliad before? Mm. So I think actually many of you have eaten a, a bromeliad, or else the fruit from a bromeliad. So I, I'm going to ask you, which one of these fruits comes from a bromeliad? Stick up your hand if you think bananas come from bromeliads. How about mangoes? Or papayas? Oh, some uncertainty there. Or pineapples? Oh, well done. OK, you guys obviously know a lot about bromeliads. Pineapples are from a type of plant which is a, a, a species of bromeliad. Now, not all bromeliads have tasty fruit like pineapples. Um, but they do have two things in common. So one of those things is that they occur in the tropics, so primarily in Central and South America. And the other thing they have in common is that they all have this rosette shape of leaves. So in all those pictures, you can see that the leaves kind of start in the center and come out like rays of the sun. OK, so they have a rosette of leaves, even though those bromeliads look really different. But there's lots of differences between bromeliad species. Some of them grow on the ground. Other ones grow on trees. And they're, we call them epiphytic bromeliads. Some of them can be really tiny. So I'm going to pass around this little bag of Spanish moss. Now, it's not moss at all even though we call it Spanish moss. It's actually a bromeliad. And when I pass this around, you can see that because you can see that there's this tiny, tiny little rosette of leaves there that joins on to another plant. So it's actually a bromeliad. It's in the genus Tillandsia. It's one of the tiniest bromeliads around. But bromeliads can also be huge. So here is uh, Jana Peterman uh, looking into a large Vriza bromeliad in our field site in Costa Rica. Uh, and this bromeliad would have five or seven liters of water. OK. Now, one thing to know about bromeliads is that they're very good at growing where there's no other plants. And there's no other plants because there's no soil and there's no nutrients in the soil. So for example, bromeliads can grow on sand, on trees, on rocks. They can even grow here, you can see them growing, on telephone wires. So there's no soil here. And in fact, their roots are just being used as whole plants, holding on to whatever they're growing on. So where do they get their nutrients from? Well, different bromeliads have different solutions to that problem. But I want to tell you about one solution. And that is bromeliads that get their nutrients from dead leaves, from the forest around them, dead tree leaves that fall into the bromeliad. And they start rotting there. They start rotting there in part because these bromeliads have their leaves so tightly pressed together that they're able to collect water between their leaves. So the dead leaves start rotting in the water. And the bromeliads have specialized structures called trichomes that um, help with the absorption of nutrients in these water tanks. But what about the insects? So that's the plants. Um, well, it turns out that if you're an aquatic insect, a bromeliad with its water-filled axles are, is a really great place to live. It's a great place for several reasons. First of all, in the tropics, there aren't a lot of lakes and ponds. In Canada, we have a lot of lakes, and that's because we have a glaciated landscape where these have been scoured out by glaciers. But in the tropics, it was never covered with glaciers. Um, so a lot of the water is actually up in the trees in Bromeliads. 
And the other great reason to be an infobrainiac is, of course, ponds are full of predators called fish. There's no fish in a brainiac. So a lot of the um, small animals that live in bromeliads are insects. There's other things like leeches and worms and ostracods. These things aren't insects. But most of the things are insects. And in, in, an insect is just a larva in the water of the bromeliad. And that larva grows and grows and grows and becomes a pupa. And then it emerges as an adult insect. And that adult insect has wings and flies around the forest. So that part, at that point in its life cycle, it's not in the bromeliad anymore. Okay, so it lives in two different parts of the forest. Now, I'm going to show you a couple uh, slides of really common bromeliad insects. In each of our field sites, there's between about 20 and 100 um, insect species that are found only in bromeliads, generally not in any other type of habitat. So I'll just give you a, a highlight of what's very common in bromeliads. First one of these is called a tipulid or crane fly larvae. Um, now these things are shredders. So they have mouth parts that are kind of like garden shears. So you guys ready for some audience participation? OK, let's all try to like, be a, sh a shredder. Very good. Try not to decapitate the person in front of you. OK, good. So those are shredders. Now, when they become adults, that's what they look like. Not a mosquito. Crane flies are larger than mosquitoes, and no, they don't bite. OK, the next main player is a beetle larvae, skirted or marsh beetles. Their larvae are these nice kind of gold-looking animals. And they eat kind of like a paint scraper. Can you try scraping? All right. And when they leave the bromeliad, that's what they look like as adults. Really different than larvae. OK, so those, the, the, the shredders and the scrapers, they are really breaking up big pieces of detritus. And when they do that, well, they're kind of messy. And they leave lots of little crumbs behind these very fine particles. And so there's other species that basically are little collectors. And it's like they're a tiny pair of tweezers picking up all these tiny little particles like this. And one of the most important ones are chironomids. Chironomids, when they grow up to be adults, they look like this, midges, not mosquitoes. And then, finally, chrysalids, which we normally call mosquitoes. Now, when they are larvae, they filter feed. And my daughter, Cedar, told me that filter feeders are kind of like when you have a sieve and you're trying to um, get all the water out of your pasta. That's what a filter feeder does. So it's like it's, the mosquito larvae have got basically brushes that they have as mouth parts. And do you guys know what they look like when they grow up? These ones do bite you. OK, so those um, are four of the most important um, groups that are eating bits of detritus. But there's more to this food web. There's also what you see at the very top, which is the word predator. So other insects are going to eat the insects that we just talked about. How do they do this? Well, some of them are piercers. So it's like they have a, a big metal straw and they pierce their prey. And then they put the end of the straw and they suck out the insides of their prey. <laughs> That's how they eat. And these tibanids emerge as adult horse flies. Ouch. But I say the best for last. This is the most charismatic of them all. This is a damselfly larvae. And it is a predator extraordinaire. So it is, has a, uh, a mouth part called a labrum that basically scoops down and up like, very fast. 
um, and catches prey between it, as fast as a mouse trap. You can barely see it. And this particular species, when it's an adult, it's this incredibly beautiful helicopter downsa fly. So these are called helicopter downsa flies um, because the wing beat of their wings is asynchronous, which gives them this incredible maneuverability, which means that they can zoom up to a spider web, and they're so good at flying that they can just grab the spider off the web without getting their wings stuck. And that's, that's really pretty much all I've seen the meet, are spy, little spiders on webs. And you'll see how long that abdomen is, which is really good for ovipositing in a bromelia, for putting an egg in a bromelia. So I want to tell you a couple of uh, cool stories about these guys, now that you know who they are. Um, the first story I'm going to tell you about is nutrients. Now, I've already told you that all the nutrients for the system are coming from the detritus. So if there's no insects in the bromeliad, the nutrients would very slowly move from the detritus to the bromeliad. That's one package of nutrients for you. OK. But is there any other species in this bromeliad that could increase how fast the nutrients are moving from the detritus, which is me, to the bromeliad? Because the detritivores are eating the detritus. When you guys eat food, does all, do all the nutrients stay in your body? No, I think we poop some out, right? And that's going to go to the Berminia. Now, these nutrients are going to let this shredder, scraper, detritivore get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And are you going to have wings? Are you going to fly away? All right, so those nutrients have left the Berminia. The Berminia still only has one package of nutrients. It's no further ahead. Okay, but is there another insect in this system who could stop the detritivore from flying away? So I think the damsel fly could eat the detritivore before it grows up big enough to leave the bromeliad with all those valuable nutrients. Okay, now the fierce damsel fly over here, of course, is going to poop as well. So we're going to have one package goes into the water, then all the way to the bromeliad, who now has two packages of nutrients. And then the damsel fly is, of course, going to grow. Now, you're going to wonder, why doesn't the damsel fly just fly away with its nutrients? Well, it does, but at a very slow rate, because you're going to learn later on that damsel flies stay in Bermudas for seven to ten months. So that process is very, very, very slow. Uh, and the, da the Bermuda over here, as a result, gets two packages of nutrients. So the damsel fly is helping the Bermuda get nutrients. It keeps the detrital nutrients in the bromeliad. Okay, so the, the bromeliad is helping the insects because it's providing a home for it, right? And now we've just learned that the insects can help the bromeliad by accelerating the breakdown of detritus into nutrients that are retained within the bromeliad. Next story I want to tell you about is bromeliad size. So we already know that bromeliads can be small and large. Um, this is a picture taken in a uh, field site in Costa Rica called Patia. And if you have the chance to go to the washrooms over here, you'll hear some of the night sounds that I recorded many years ago <laughs> at that field station. Um, so here we've got uh, a Romania that contains about 50 mils of water. Um, the one on the left hand side, and the one on the right hand side probably has about five liters of water. Okay, so about a hundred times more water. So that has got to make a difference to the insects. And it does. The, the types of insects that occur in both bromeliads are, are pretty different. And the most stunning difference is to do with the downs of flies. So if you look, if you just survey bromeliads at different sizes, you find that in bromeliads that are smaller than about 100 <coughs> mils, you just never find these downs of fly larvae. And then you get to 100 mils, and suddenly every bromelia has down supply. So why this really sharp threshold? Well, the first thing we wondered is, is it because the adults are only putting eggs, ovipositing, in the big bromelias? And indeed, there's something very interesting going in there. It turns out that when we started watching these guys in the, in the breeding season, 
that the males, which are the ones with the red dots on the wing, those are mature males, um, that they guard bromeliads, individual bromeliads as territories. Um, and they will only do this, or they primarily do this, for the large bromeliads. Um, in fact, they, and they guard them, they stay there day after day. So you see that this uh, bromeliad has number 33 on it. It wasn't born that way. <laughs> it's down the blood. It's number 33. Um, so I marked them with a sharpie so that I could figure out how long they're staying at each bromeliad. So they will spend day after day there, forego important feeding times to defend this bromeliad. Another male down the flight comes along, and basically they point, they're so maneuverable, they zoom up until they're staring like eyeball to eyeball to each other. And then they engage in this game of chicken until one either flies away or the other one tries to dive bomb the other one. And there are these fights over these bromeliads. So why are these big bromeliads so valuable? Well, because the female damselflies were pretty much only oviposit in big bromeliads. When I watched where they were ovipositing, you can see in bromeliads that are less than 100 mils, they hardly ever oviposit in those bromeliads. When they're greater than 100 mils, they love ovipositing there. So that is like the proximate reason, but why do the females not like ovipositing in small bromeliads? Well, we tried lots of different explanations. First, we transplanted larvae to, to bromeliads of different sizes to see if there, there was not enough food. Um, that seemed fine. Then we uh, looked to see if uh, terrestrial predators were able to dive into the small bromeliads to catch the amplified larvae. Well, they can, but it, they can do that in big and small bromeliads. That wasn't the answer. And finally, um, what became apparent is that small bromeliads just dry up more, more frequently. Now, for many insects, that's not an issue. Many insects, they live like two, three, four weeks in a bromeliad. Um, and here's some data where we've looked at the water depth in bromeliads over an entire year. This is actually just one bromeliad, three different leaves that have been monitored for a year. And you can see that the water level goes up and down. Uh, but generally, there's water in the bromeliad until you get to one part of the year where it's completely dried out. Um, and you can get up to 22 uh, consecutive dry days. Now, down to fly, we know from experiments, uh, can't survive that many dry days. So if you're spending seven to, seven to 10 months in a bromeliad, you want to make sure your bromeliad doesn't dry out. So hence, there's a strong selection for um, larger bromeliad. And in fact, when we looked at all insects in bromeliads, we could see that the insects that in general are more sensitive to drought, so on this side of the graph, are also the ones that prefer the large bromeliads, so at the top of the graph. And this one is a bit of an outlier from that relationship. That's a mosquito called Waiamaya. I'm going to tell you about that uh, in just a minute. Okay, so now we know that a bromeliad this size is going to, every axle is going to contain a down supply larvae. Now that must be really scary for those that try divorce, right? They are living in fear. Any minute they could be chomped. What do they do with that fear? How do they behave? Well, I'd like to tell you about some work um, that Ed Hamill, who is in my lab, um, did with um, how insects respond to fear. So what he did is he first emptied out um, 30 bromeliads, nothing in them, um, put some detritus back in, put some water back in. And then in each bromeliad, he did one of three things. He either put a uh, down supply in the bromeliad in a cage. So that's a plastic tube with a hole drilled in the side and a bit of mesh. So the water can flow in and out of the tube, but the damselfly can't. Um, or we had the damselfly free, so they could eat things. And of course, we had the tube in there just in case a plastic tube has some effect. And then finally, we had bromeliads with no damselfly, but we kept the tube just in case the tube, plastic tube has an effect. And then we waited a month and saw what insects colonize the bromeliads. Okay, so um, on the left 
is the number of mosquitoes that colonized the Vinette. On the right, the number of detritivores that colonized it. Um, so when there was no predator, the word none, you got lots of mosquitoes and detritivores colonizing. When the damselflies were free to eat everything, the word free on the far right, you got a lot fewer mosquitoes and detritivores. But what was really unexpected, we, did, we knew that damselflies would eat things, so there'd be less of them. But what was really unexpected is that when we put them in cages, so the damselflies couldn't eat anything, there were still fewer mosquitoes and detritivores. So what's going on here? is that the adult insects are smelling this damselfly. They can't see it in that cage. They can't hear it. Um, but, they, but insects turn out to be very good at smelling things. And so they can smell the damselfly in that water, and they avoid those bromeliads that where there's a damselfly that would eat their offspring. Now that is what happens with the adults in terms of fear. But what about the larvae that are in a bromeliad, and then they're like, oh, a damselfly has just entered my well, my leaf well. What do I do? Well, they might do something quite different. OK. So I'm going to show you a little picture of what, how mosquito uh, behave. This is also just um, from YouTube. <laughs> a lot, right? They're feeding down at the bottom here. And they're rising to the surface to breathe, because they, they breathe through a cycle in the body. Now, if you are if you are a damselfly, having something twitch in front of you and you're a visual predator means that you can see them really easily. So if, you, if the mosquito larvae instead stop twitching and they just go to the surface where they're going to breathe but not go down, up and down in front of the damselfly's nose, then the damselfly probably won't notice them and probably won't eat them. So what we could do is we could put, down, put mosquitoes in water that either was just regular Bermudaad water or water where a damselfly had been sitting. The damselfly is not in the water anymore. It just smells of the damselfly. And if they smell that the damselfly has been there, they, some of the mosquitoes stop, um, stop their twitching, and they float to the surface. So these ones on the left, called culex, as soon as we put them in this predator-conditioned water, they start behaving differently. They rise to the surface, and they stop twitching. But this mosquito over here, called Waimaya, it can't do that. It can't smell the damselfly. It just behaves normally. And so um, it has, it's pretty defenseless against the damselfly predator. Now, does anybody remember when I talked about Wyomia earlier in this talk? Yeah, do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember it was when I talked about bromeliad size. And we said, hmm, this species of mosquito occurs in smaller bromeliads then you'd predict just by its drought tolerance. Well, the reason, it turns out, it occurs in smaller bromeliads is it's trying to get her away from the damselfly. So the larvae just avoid the damselfly. They're, they're never, the eggs are never oviposited in those bromeliads with damselflies. Um, Culex, on the other hand, is quite happy to have its eggs oviposited in bromeliads with damselflies, because when the larvae smell the damselfly, they just behave differently in a way that stops them from being eaten. And finally, so this is all about insects being afraid of damselflies. What do you think that damselflies are afraid of? What do you think damselflies are afraid of? Animals that are bigger than them. Absolutely. And here's an animal that's bigger than them. A bird. So the adult damselflies are afraid of birds, because birds eat adult damselflies. And so my colleague, Gustavo Romero, and his lab in Brazil have put stuffed birds, this species of kiskadee that's very common 
from Central and South America, right next to bromeliads. So on sticks next to bromeliads. And those bromeliads that have these birds don't get colonized by damselflies, because the damselflies stay away, because they're afraid of the birds. So you can see there's this task, cascade of terror going on in the system. Which brings me, we're starting to talk about terrestrial animals. That's the final way cool story, the terrestrial animals. So the coolest story I know is about ants. So in some areas of South America, uh, for example, in French Guiana, where this picture, these pictures were taken, ants build ant gardens, which means they, they make a nest and they plant seeds of specific plants in this nest. And one of those is this species of bromeliad. Not just any bromeliad, this species of bromeliad. Um, and the roots of the bromeliad grow around the nest, and they keep the nest together. Because this is part of the world that's very heavy rains, uh, which can um, really impact uh, ant nests. And the bromeliad, in return, gets extra nutrients because its roots are finely in something like soil. There's two ant species that do this. One of them likes to take the bromeliad to sunny areas. And this species of bromeliad grows like this in sunny areas. This other ant likes to take it to shady areas in the forest. And the same species of bromeliad looks like that when it's grown in the shade. And so the shape of the bromeliad, same species of bromeliad, really changes depending on which ant takes it where. And it turns out that really affects the insects that live inside the bromeliad, because the bromeliads have different characteristics when they have different shapes. Um, <clears throat> and then one of the insects, which is a predatory mosquito larvae, has actually figured out how to grab ants from as they go down to the surface, the water surface, to have a drink or they even fall in. So it starts to live off the ants. So those are called ant gardens. Some other cool terrestrial animals that live in Bermudians, frogs and spiders. So here, the big story is poop, yet again. <laughs> so these things eat terrestrial insects they poop in the bromeliad, and dead carcasses fall in the bromeliad. Lots of, nitrogen, lots of nitrogen going to the bromeliad. Well, my colleagues have fed these uh, fruit flies that they've labeled with stable isotopes, so a chemical marker. You can see that chemical marker go into the bromeliad and into the bromeliad leaves. So we know that these animals are helping bromeliads grow. One of the coolest uh, stories of this the strawberry um, poison dart frogs. Uh, so we actually had a whole way cool talk about this species. Um, the um, mothers bring tadpoles to bromeliads on their back. They put a tadpole in the bromeliad. Uh, the tadpole develops there. The mother comes to visit it about every four days. Okay, and she drops off a little present for it every time. It's a sterile, nutritive egg, just for nutrition. So she feeds it these sterile eggs every four days and throughout its larval phase until it develops. Um, and it can pop out. One of the interesting things that we discovered is that this species, we didn't know it until uh, we studied it about two years ago, and um, it can actually grab mosquito larvae as well to supplement its diet. And all that high, all those nutritive eggs, all that tadpole poop ends up adding nitrogen to the bromeliad, and you can see it again in this ke the chemical composition of the bromeliad leaves. And finally, there's things like spiders that build webs over the entire bromeliad. Of course, this really stops insects from either ovipositing or from emerging. And this is a muscomorpha in French Guiana. So I thought you might want to know a little bit about how we study bromeliads. Um, the first step is just to get to the bromeliad. This can be challenging at times. Sometimes we've even used ropes to get up trees. Um, then we measure various things about the bromeliad, how many leaves, how much water it 
carries, that kind of stuff. Next step is to empty out the vermilion. Um, here I'm washing vermilion. We use pipe heading, washing, or dissecting, depending on the question in the system. And once we've washed everything out, we then have a pile of detritus and mortar. We sieve it a bit to concentrate it. We put it out in white trays, because you can see insects really easily against white. And then we spend a lot of time searching for it. Yeah. Tedious and needing good eyesight to task. And then finally, we have a list of all the insects that occur in Verminians. But to figure out how they work, we also have to do experiments. So here we are in the field, setting up experiments. We can do things like we can put a cage around a Verminiant. Uh, in this case, uh, here's Gustavo Romero, and he's putting a, a PVC cage around a Verminiant um, that keeps a spider in the Verminiant without leaving and prevents other spiders from coming in. So it's just a PVC with a bit of uh, Vaseline around the top dug into the soil. We can also keep rain out. So here's a rain shelter for Verminiant, and then we can uh, water it according to a very predefined working schedule with a working can. Um, and we can s we've done this at seven different sites throughout uh, Central and South America to see if climate change impacts are going to have the same impact in different parts of the world. Now, if the Brumeniad as a whole is too big to study, we can do smaller scale experiments by assembling insects in little tubes and one tube goes into each well of the bromeliad. And you can see they've got little mesh hats on. That's to catch the insects as they emerge and to stop things that we don't want in those tubes from getting in. And finally, some questions are just better done with artificial replicas of bromeliads. Now, where do we study bromeliad insects? Well, everywhere they occur. Um, so this is data from the Bromeliad Working Group, which is a group that I started in 2010. And we're now 45 researchers uh, working at uh, 15 sites now throughout Central and South America, including the Caribbean. And as you can see, there's a massive change in the number of insects we find in each site um, between these. Uh, for example, the sites in the Caribbean, these tiny islands, generally are, have much smaller numbers of species because not, not as many species could colonize these areas. So we study Romanians in rainforests. We study them in uh, the short forests that grow on sand dune habitat. These are called closure stinga forests in Atlantic Brazil. And we study them in um, open sand areas. Uh, we get there through our fieldwork uh, on ATVs. We get to field sites by boat. When we get there, we could live in a wooden station, as in Costa Rica, or in a tent, because it's too hot to be inside that nearby house. And in French Guiana, um, hammocks that are hung up underneath mosquito nets. We have lots of uh, friends that we find in these accommodations, scorpions, Tarantulas and towels, so even frogs that like to hang out in toilets, bats in the showers. But there's also lots of very cool uh, critters, like this long horned beetle. There's caterpillars and chameleons. There's cicadas. Snakes. Hadeas. And birds, like this red cat mannequin and this curse and there's some information um, in the museum on uh, some Bromeliad insects. There's in the Ecology and Conservation uh, exhibit. For now, I'd just like to thank all the members of the Bromeliad Working Group who contributed uh, stories and photos that I've used here. I'm ready for your questions.